Hi guys, welcome back. It's a bit strange being this side of the camera for a change. Now today is a very exciting day. This is the first time that I've managed to get out and get the new Air Arms XTI-50 on film. I've been waiting for this patiently for a number of years. As many of you know, the world's changed since this started. This rifle has evolved significantly in the last few years of its development. It is basically built to be and to dominate in field target. Once the Hunter field target crew started to have a look at this, the team shooters and things, they all went, we want a bit of that as well. So it's been tweaked and sort of modified and evolved even more so, so that it can be used successfully for Hunter field target as well as field target. This is the limited edition red and black laminate one, as you can see, it's a Manelli made stock. Contrary to all the rumors on the internet things, I had no involvement with the stock design or anything like that. Had I had some involvement in it, it would probably have ended up very similar lines to this. As a factory stock goes, it feels very nice. It handles very, very well. Some really interesting design features with this, and there's some really mad, very small touches, but they all help to bring this together to be a very user-friendly rifle and capable of winning. It's built like a tank and it's designed to handle the worst of the weather. Now field targets growing very quickly in a lot of more obscure countries. You've got sort of Eastern Europe, Southeastern Europe, the climate there is a lot hotter. You've got America, they're also starting to take it on. They may get huge temperature swings through the day. You may get at least 30 degrees of temperature change from the start of shoot to the end of shoot. This is built to take it. It's beefed up significantly in a lot of places from the FTP 900 that it replaces. It's still got very similar lines. If you squint at this from a distance, you'll go, yeah, it sort of looks like an FTP. Well, you're right. Most of that's down to this swooping breach here. We'll get to that in a little bit, and I'll tell you why that's significant and why that sort of design feature has stayed on the new XTI. So we'll start at the rear. We're just gonna do a quick overview of this. I'll show you when we get back home some of the groups I've already shot. It's very early stages yet. I've only managed to get 50 odd pellets through it. Been pretty busy flying around, however, as this evolves, as I get used to it, it's all going to go on film. So you will see exactly what happens, how it happens, and when it happens. Right, okay, let's start a little walk through then. We'll start from the rear, we'll work our way through, and hopefully I can cover most of the things that I find really interesting about this. Now the butt hook on here, completely new design for the XTI. It has as much adjustability as the industry standards that you would see in the custom and aftermarket world. It's much lighter though. There was an awful lot more time put into machining away any excess material to keep the weight down. The whole theme with this is to keep it as light as physically possible. Now, some of you will say, yeah, well, heavy guns are more accurate. Yeah, that's true. If you're a tiny fella like me, if you're a lady wants something a bit lighter, a little bit more nimble handling, this may well be for you, of course. When you've got a lighter gun, if you want to add ballast to it, you certainly can do. There's a lot of little cubby holes in here that you could ballast it down if you wanted something a bit more front heavy. If you wanted it a bit more rear weight biased, you could actually then add some weight on. So starting with a lighter gun, whilst not compromising on its rigidity or its strength, is certainly gonna be beneficial. It's gonna make it much more usable for a lot more people. So anyhow, butt hook. This is, as I said, this is the HFT version on here. So this has a slightly more paired back hook. The field target version has a couple of additional links. You can even buy more if you wanted it to go right up over your shoulder. This does actually come with an underarm hook, although that wouldn't be compliant for the majority of HFT rules. So you'll end up using it as I've got it here. There's a huge range of adjustment on here. We've got a couple of inches of additional length of pull so we can move the butt hook back and forth. The ball joint on here allows you to sort of pivot it 360 around that ball joint. So if you need to turn it into your shoulder, you can do, you can tilt the pad back. We've also got the little locking bolt here so you can adjust the height as well. Now we've got a massive amount of depth adjustment here. So if you're very tall, for instance, and you're shooting HFT prone, you're gonna be able to drop that really low if you need to. So there's a ton of adjustment, more than you're gonna find on practically anything else on the market. There's so many small things that have been tweaked and changed. Basically nothing is the same as your FTP. These little brackets that are dropped into the stock, the clamping parts, you can see here that they are completely toolless. The older ones used to have thumb bolts on them. They used to have thumb wheels on them, but you never really could torque them up quite enough. So they often ended up being dumb valent keys. Well, these little clamps in the top here, they've been completely redesigned. So they actually clamp now onto the outside of the post. Even the outside edges of these, they're pushed in and they're sealed on gaskets to stop any crud and dirt and stuff getting down in all these little crevices and working its way into the woodwork. Of course, if you get rain in it, it's gonna run down the post in and out, but all of the little crevices now are completely gasket sealed. So that just gives you an idea of the level of 
thought and everything that's gone into this. Field target is being shot in more and more countries all around the world. The weather and the extreme conditions that are often faced by the modern HFT and FT crowds are significantly worse generally than what we're going to get in the UK. Multi-adjustable, ball-jointed cheek piece. Again, I think possibly this little clamp section may well be the only part that I'd recognise from the FTP. Even the little rail section is different. The cheek rollover on there, that actually is exactly the same as what I use on my Anschutz myself. So my pink and black Anschutz that you probably have seen on the channel already. Got the same cheek rollovers. Now, that cheek rollover is incredibly consistent. You get it set right, you'll have an incredibly consistent sight line. It's comfortable to shoot all day. However, it will give you a perfect sight line when you've got it set right. So really nice. I'm glad that the team decided to use that. I mean, so many people were involved in the build of these, in the testing stages and things. A couple of the things that I had suggested have made it through to the final piece, which is pretty cool. Grip on here, two thumb positions. Now we've got a more traditional thumb through almost, so an elevated thumb through up here. Thumb on the side, this is fairly common. A lot of HFT shooters use the thumb on the side, especially for kneeling shots. It just allows you to drop your wrist a little bit more. I personally, this, it looks quite cool, but I don't know that I'll use this. The thumb through is gonna be more what I'm used to. You can see underneath here of the actual grip itself, there's a little spacer on here. This is all slightly different to what you had with the FTP. The FTP had sort of slots all cut into the grip itself, and then you had an adjustable palm shelf that went up and down. Now, that made the grip fairly fragile. It also meant if you wanted to use it for HFT, you'd have to lock the bottom of the grip off so you had ground clearance shooting it prone. What we've got now is a selection of different spacers. So it comes with, and believe it or not, these are actually milled aluminium, these black spacers. I thought they would be something like acetal or something like, you know, an engineering plastic, but these are actually milled aluminium or CNC dally, should I say. This one is 10 mil thick. You get another one at five mil thick and then you get a palm shelf, which simply can be bolted on the bottom. Now, I don't think I'm gonna to need to use that. I'm probably going forward, I might actually have a little look and see if I can make some of these in laminate possibly. We'll see, something for the down the line I think, but I'm sure it won't be long before I do start to modify it. Trigger. Everything inside this trigger is different to every single one of the previous Air Arms rifles. We've got completely different sear arrangement. The sears in this are absolutely massive which is quite surprising. I've only got about 50 to 60 shots off of it at the moment. I haven't modified it. I was gonna start making some trigger adjustments. I wanted to reduce the first stage a little bit, but I haven't. It's exactly as it left the factory. I mean, I know what you were gonna ask me. How does this trigger compare to the trigger in the 9015? Well, ultimately at the moment, it's slightly heavier than what I've got mine set to in the 9015, but this is very crisp. It breaks cleanly. There's no hint of creep. There's slightly more first stage take up than I would like, which again, that can easily be adjusted out. So that's what we'll do further down the line. It's too early to say yet, but I will let you know down the line. A huge amount of adjustment. I mean, you've got more adjustment in the terms of the actual trigger blade itself. Because of the way this is sort of mounted, you've got this little cross pin here, you've got the height and you can swing it out. It needs that adjustability because the grip itself here, the palm swell is actually offset. The palm swell itself is actually offset to the right hand side of the stock. This out apply here is actually the widest part down the right side of this stock. Doing that, it somewhat triangulates you. It keeps a straighter right arm if you're a right handed shooter. Works very, very well. Keeps your wrist nice and relaxed. Next thing then, the whole action itself. Completely new action. Similar lines to the FTP. Now, if you squint at it from a distance, when you see this swoops top edge here, you're gonna go, well, it looks a bit like an FTP. Well, it does. However, the breech block on this is significantly more substantial. Now, the FTP was no lightweight. It had a massive block. The width of this block, it's about a quarter of inch wider. It's gotta be at least six mil broader. It's definitely got some hips on it above the gauge here on this side. I will spin it around in a moment so you can see. But everything sort of here, regulated forward to the barrel, this has been significantly reinforced, a bit more bulk there. Again, just to help it deal with temperature change, humidity change, any weird pressure on the stock, it's just been reinforced significantly. The biggest change that you're gonna see with the XTI over anything Air Arms have done before is this now has a stabilizer system in it. So much like you'll see in the Styre and the Anschutz, underneath of the cocking bolt here, there's basically a little piston weight you take a shot, 
pellet goes that way, twangs the little piston weight backwards, science happens, it reduces your recoil. It is adjustable, no idea how yet, haven't got that far. Down the line we'll look at how it adjusts, but stabilised action, what does it mean? Is it gonna make it more accurate? Well, inherently no, it won't make the gun any more accurate, but when you can see them pellets in flight, if you're shooting a very shot up target, and you can see where that pellet strikes, even if you've missed it, that information is very, very important. And if you can use that information to say, well, maybe I misread the wind or maybe I misranged it, that may well then help you on your next target along. So a stabilised action, whilst not incredibly important for a lot of people, if you're competing at the high end, it will give you some more information that could take you up to become a world champion maybe. I don't know, it's certainly nice to have a stabilised action. It gives me a lot more information when I'm shooting and of course I'm quite familiar with how a stabilised action works. I've been using them for the best part of 10 years on other brands. So down the line we'll be able to do some direct comparisons. Is this as good as Grand Schutz and your style and things like that? On the side here we've got a power adjuster. So on this side, I will flip it around in a moment, we've got an anti-tamper screw on here. That is a seven spline security Torx, very secure. On the side here, Allen head, and then underneath of that's a grub screw. It's preset at a factory maximum power, and if you want to pitch it up or down a tad from there, you can do. Right, around the barrel itself, the fore end of this block, as I've mentioned, is massive. It's completely reinforced. We've got a completely new barrel. This barrel was designed and developed between Lothar Walther and the Air Arms factory. It starts life as a 16 mil blank. Outside of its ground down, it ends up around 15.5 to 15.8 mil in its midsection. Both ends are then ground down concentric to the bore to fit in the breech block and inside the airstrip. Right now, this is a fantastic barrel. It is a very, very high spec barrel. It goes through various post machining processes. It's diamond polished. Through testing, they've proven to be, well, can you say anything's unfussy, but most of the ammo that's gone through this in testing as groups significantly better than you would expect from some of the other barrels. Air arms are always well known for having decent barrels. This is no exception. Decent bit of kit, built by Lone Walther, machined and finished off at the Air Arms factory. Regulator inside here. The reg in this is actually derived from the reg in the S510s, the TRs, the regulated version. So, it's a completely different reg to what you'd have found in the FTP, the EV2s and things like that. It's actually a sort of a slightly evolved TR type reg. Now, over the chronos for the paperwork we've got, it's showing really fancy, very, very tight strings. It seems to work very well. Every single one of these regs is cycled, well, it's cycled, what, every three seconds for an hour. So looking at the chrono figures they've got, it made 105 shots all within 11 feet per second. When I get back home, I'll get some pictures and you can see the whole sort of test sheet it came with, all the serial numbers and the group that it shot at factory. It's now why titanium? Well, to be fair, it's cool. I mean, that's the, uh, ultimately that's the long and short of it for me. Titanium is basically impervious to elements. You obviously want to clean your rifles off after you've used them, but if it gets wet, it gets muddy, anything like that, it takes an awful lot for this to go scabby. So more importantly though, you've got three main options when it comes to picking air cylinder tubing. Historically, pretty much everything air arms has been a steel cylinder, FTP, HFT 500, steel cylinders. You've also got aluminium. Titanium comes actually somewhere slightly in the middle weight wise. However, this is where it gets really cool. If you've got an alley cylinder, yes, it might be slightly lighter, but the wall thickness is quite a lot more, which means the internal volume is greatly reduced on an aluminium cylinder over a titanium cylinder. So for this size of cylinder, we can get 100 full power shots out of this. In fact, it's usually just a little bit more. My chrono sheet for this one gave 105, and looking at the start and the finish of that shot cycle or that string, you probably could have squeezed a couple more out. Funky little windicator up the front. Now this is basically just a little stick on this one. The FT version has a little bubble in here, you know, out of like a spirit level type bubble to check if you're canting. Couple of O-rings on the end so you can hang a bit of string off of there, feather, anything like that, useful. I mean, I thought actually I probably wouldn't use that, but then I was thinking actually going forward with filming, I'm always trying to tell you what the wind's doing. So actually we'll probably put a little bit of chenille on here and that will, instead of having the flags out and the goat eating them, that'll probably be quite cool. Under the end cap here, standard Air Arms T-Bar filler. Standard on almost all of their rifles, it works very well. I may well end up swapping this over to a Foster fit, especially with the filming now flying back and forwards, I've got a snap fit on the actual pump itself. 
I've got the same Foster fitting on the, in fact I've got it on the S510, the Ultima Sporter, actually it's also got a Foster fit on it. Airstripper up the end, something you'd normally only find on pretty much custom builds to be honest. Adjustable airstripper, I've got some photos but underneath we've also got some sort of ruler scaling on there because it just simplifies the setup and adjustment. Does it make much of a difference? Well, there has been a huge amount of different strippers being used throughout the testing process. This is one of the smallest, we've actually one of the steepest cones as well and according to the team this gave some of the best performance. Also the cone inside of here is titanium, so if the worst ever does happen and it gets clipped by a pellet, I mean it shouldn't do, but if it does you're not going to get it damaged and dinged like the aluminium one. So a little tie cone in there, looks cool, works nice, it does seem to do a reasonable job of deflecting the blast. This is very very still on firing. Here's the hamps mech, I've got some other footage as well. So on the side here you've got this little push button, you've also got two little thumb wheels here. These little thumb wheels are locks. If you're shooting HFT with this, of course, you've got slightly more limited range of adjustment, so you can drop it to about there. That's pretty much as far as you can drop it whilst becoming HFT legal. Now, of course, you've got a little button sticking out the side of this. This was something else that I've mentioned to the team a few years ago. You've got a button sticking out the side of this. If you come opposite side on a peg, HFT peg, and you happen to knock that, the last thing you wanna do is then collapse your adjustable hamster. So. We've got little tool list locking knobs on here. You can set it in position at the start of a comp, lock it, and it can't go anywhere. So nice little touch there, a lot safer for HFT users, of course. If you're shooting primarily FT with it, you'd leave that unlocked, and then you can adjust it between shots if you need to. So super simple. There's a broad range of adjustment here. A lot of hamster mechs, they suffer after a few cycles, they start to get a bit of play in them. This is super robust, it's got two locking pins. Now the really cool thing about this is that the detent positions, its locking positions are much finer than anything else on the market. The single button on the side to adjust it, it just becomes a much more fluid motion than having to undo it in the middle while supporting the gun right-handed. Move it, lock it again, it's just a much more seamless movement, works incredibly well. Here's the interesting thing, I shot this a couple of days ago. I'm not that good at shooting off the knee FT style. I'm pretty wobbly, my shoulder's a bit wobbly. It was incredibly stable off the knee. Now I've got the cards at home I'll show you in a bit, but I shot some fantastic groups off the knee, which did surprise me because I can't really shoot off the knee that well. It's not a position I find very comfortable. However, shot pretty well. As you can probably tell, this little bipod that I've just popped on at the front here, there's a short section of UIT rail, so that's standard accessory rail up the front here. Great if you want to put a bipod on there maybe, or if you want to put a sling stud in there, something like that. Underneath of the hamster part itself, under the plate, we've also got a short section here of UIT accessory rail. So this is the standard size, as is the little piece that you probably can't see. If you wanted to put on like a bean bag or something underneath, that sort of thing, that might well be a good option. So overall, I'm really quite chuffed with this. Oh, I'll tell you what, the case as well, a few people said about the case. It comes in a really nice Negrini, basically a flight case, quite a stout case. I've got the pictures. This is how it'll arrive with you from the shop. Now that's how it's laid out for safe transport. If it's got to go through customs and things around the world, that's laid out like that so that they can lift up the cock and handle, check the serial numbers and things like that. I've already modified the foam inside my case to keep it together. Now, if you've got a massive FT scope on it, you're probably going to struggle to get it all in. I can definitely get a much larger scope in there than the CP, but the case itself will take it, put together, certainly with a mid to large scope on there. I'll put the pictures up of that as well. So I knew I'd forget a few things. The main reason that block's kept swooped like that, similar to the FTP now, it is of different profile. It sits on top of the stock itself. Now the main reason for that is to stop your rain, your dust and your poop getting down and into the trigger. Now on the FTP it works very well. The overlap is even bigger still on this one. So it won't entirely stop it, but it will certainly make it a little bit more resilient in the worst of the weather. Really, really important one that I had forgotten about. You can have full lefty actions as well. So of course, this is a right-handed one with a right-handed stock. You've got left-handed stocks and you've also got fully left-handed actions available. Certainly for us sinister lefties, we're not gonna be left out on this one. So main reason they've done it as handed actions as opposed to an ambidextrous action 
is that to make this ambidextrous so you could flip the cocking lever one side or t'other, you'd think, well, it save a bit of money, but it would do. However, it will actually reduce the structure in the back end of the action itself quite significantly. So that's why they are dedicated left or right handers. All the part numbers for the bits and pieces are in the instruction manual as well. I haven't actually asked to confirm it, but they do list a left-handed breech block, a right-handed breech block, as well as, of course, the stocks. So pretty good in that respect. Right, I'll take you home. I'll show you what I've shot with it. Right then, this is the group that I shot the other day. So we've got just over 50 pellets here. It took me a little while to actually get it on the card. It turns out that that riser rail, that UTG one, when I wanted to pinch it up onto the dovetails of the um, XTI, it didn't pinch up very well. So I had a couple that actually missed the backstop to start when I was thinking, oh Christ, what's going on here? And yeah, I got it soon sorted readjusted the actual riser rail and everything was good so these are my first zero in shots hft prone so that's a nice stable one but on the deck supporting the front of the rifle with my leading hand these little squares are just over five and a half mil so a slightly funny size square mm, just over five and a half mil five and a half mil shooting up the peg this is a slightly more wobbly position so the butt of the rifle is in the shoulder supporting the front of the rifle against the peg so that's quite normal for me i'll shoot a slightly wider group or a slightly larger group up the peg than I would do HFT prone. Needing shots, I was doing quite well with those. There's four in that little bottom group there. My mate rang me and I ended up wobbling off and putting that one in the top. So overall, but I don't consider these to count. The camera wasn't on, there's no proof. All I'm showing you is a card, but I'm just wanting to show you what we've actually shot. Now off the knee, so this is FT sitting position. This is a position that I'm really not comfortable in. It's a position I don't regularly shoot and I have very little experience shooting in that position. However, I was very surprised. This was the worst group that I shot, and that's probably just under 10 mil. So most of them went through the top, dropped one a little bit low. Considering I have very little experience in that position, the groups that I shot were fantastic. Now, I'm hoping that this wasn't a fluke. Of course, this rifle is designed primarily as an FT rifle. To be shot off your knee in this position, it felt very, very stable off my knee. Going forward, if it means that I can start shooting FT sitting position, great. I'll be really happy with that. The way it handles, it felt very, very stable. So these two here, I'd put the bipod on for a couple of groups. They're slightly smaller than all of the others, as you'd expect, just that little bit more stable. And we're looking just over five and a half mil, which considering random pellets, uncleaned barrel, I'm really quite happy with that. I think with a bit more setup and a bit of fine tuning, there may well be a chance to tighten these up. Bearing in mind, it's only 25 yards. We're not really pushing it hard at the moment. We'll take it out to 45 and further in time. But for a start, I was really quite happy with that. But no camera, no footage of that, not worried, these don't count, but this is what I want to show you. This is the factory test card, so you can see my serial number up the top there. Apparently these are done at 25 metres indoors, turn that on, and that's about 6 mil. I think there's 10 shots in there, it's lightly clamped in the rest at the factory, so consistent across all of the rifles they're testing, but that would indicate with the random pellets that are used they're not weighed they're not sorted or anything like that that there is a potential that this may well be bench rest accurate so certainly interesting to test it i'm going to um, do a lot more with prepped pellets as well down the line so yeah overall pretty happy with that just going to flick through this if you want to see it just pause it and have a look 105 shots every single one of those is logged now when these rifles are put together there's one fella that builds these at the factory and he builds two XTIs a day. So he's putting in four to four and a half hours per rifle in terms of setup, tweaking it. That's just for the action. That's not including assembling the hamster mech and things. They're all quite involved things to put together. That four and a half hours just goes into setting up of the rifle, making sure it's okay. That rifle and every rifle that comes out of the factory has gone through at least three and a half to four full fills, so it would have done about 400 shots or just a little bit under over the chrono through setup and testing. So you're probably gonna see a little bit of dust on the old air stripper, but that gives you an idea of how fastidious the factory are being with the setup on these. And hopefully that will mean down the line that every single one that reaches a customer works as it ought to out of the box. So hopefully that will play out as they plan it to. I mean, let's be honest, if you make enough of anything mechanical, there's obviously always going to be one that's a Friday afternoon one. But looking at how rigorous they're building these and the sort of regime that they go through, that should be really, really reduced. Now, we have actually got um, an invitation to go and visit the factory. So in the next couple of weeks, I'm hoping to take the cameras down there. We'll go and have a look around. We'll go and see if we can do some filming of them making the XTIs because that would be pretty cool to see. I'd like to see a million them breech blocks out and putting all the bits and pieces together. So overall, guys, just for a first overview, I'm really quite happy so far. 
I've got a load more testing to do with it. I'm going to take you along the way. We'll see how it pans out and we'll start comparing it to some of my other guns. So I'll see you in the next one.